Most architects have external limitations placed on their creativity. Clients tell them what kind of buildings they want and how much money they have to spend. Well, one firm in San Francisco works the other way around. It starts with an idea, and then it looks for clients and money. Chip, Doug, and Curtis don't work like other architects. We don't wait for someone to come to us to hire us to design a building that has a program, but rather we try and generate or originate our own ideas. You know, it was 1968, there was revolution in the air. Nobody wanted to go to work in a corporate architecture office. Uh, at that time, a Bank of America was something that you burned down. You didn't want to be designing banks. We decided to start an alternative architecture practice. Architecture was, in many ways, stagnant. This was the point at which the critique of modernist architecture in, in its own reductive, universalizing social project was being made vigorously. It was so parsimonious. It was so um, uninvolved in pleasure. Well, we were trying to think of a name for our group. A friend of Chip's, uh, we were sitting around one night talking about underground newspapers and underground movies, and we said we wanted to do underground architecture in 68. And she said, oh, you mean like an ant farm? Yes. It was a perfect metaphor for how they saw themselves as architects, little ants in this little plastic structure. And the ant farm said, no, that's a lot of shit. We have to take the power out of the hands of the planners. We have to break the plastic of the ant farm, and set the ants free. All was being wrought asunder. You know, there's the war in Vietnam, we were taking LSD, things were bifurcating before our eyes. You know, this was the era of mass demonstrations, of spontaneous rock festivals, of communal living. People were trying very hard to live lives that somehow evaded the demands of consumerism in the system. The subversive, irresponsible, unreliable, cock you, snooze, fuck you, alternative style of practice. They fertilized the possibility of overturning old habits, you know, which is something that every generation needs to have the ability to do. They were prophets. They weren't just throwing Molotov cocktails. They were throwing bombs that would explode into new things. When you look at the target that they're addressing, not only the oil crisis, but car culture in America, the presidency, um, the uh, Zapruder film. And distill that down with graphics, living efforts, piece of videotape, or maybe just an attitude or a wink, and put that in context so that people would get it right away and get a chuckle from it. They were comedians, and I, I mean this as, a, as the highest form of compliment. Insisting on no dividing line or visible dividing line between when they were serious and when they were absolute tricksters. But that kind of South Park sensibility that we now take for granted in popular culture was something that was being born at that time. And the Ant Farm kind of brought that into architecture. Really, Ant Farm is a collage of a lot of different styles. And there was such an interesting synergy between the main players, between Curtis and Chip and Doug. I always think of it a little bit like the Beatles, where you put these people together and the synergistic energy just amplifies what each of them can do separately. And certainly Ant Farm was structured that way. I mean, it really was, in a sense, like a, like a psychotic <laughs> architectural office. If they had to build something, they built something. If it was on paper, it was on paper. If it was video, if it was a guerrilla action, it was a guerrilla action. It didn't matter. They didn't say, this is not what an architect does. They rather asked, what does an architect do? And in a way, that was the most important kind of question that could be asked at that point about architecture.
what we were trying to do was do the ultimate form of, of architecture, which was essentially predicting how society would use space, land, and time. <laughs>